On the 6th of June 1944, a huge amphibious and airborne force landed on the coast of northern France, intent on reversing the tide of the Second World War. The meticulously planned operation included waves of beach assaults, naval bombardments, airstrikes and parachute drops, all on a scale never seen before. Codenamed D-Day, the invasion saw the beginning of the end of the Nazi occupation of Europe. D-Day has been reenacted in at least five major films. I'm sure you'll have seen at least one of them. Where Eagles Dare focuses on the group of commandos sent high into the Alps on a daring mission to rescue a captured American officer who divulges D-Day plans. The Big Red One is a more factual account. The film title refers to the US Army 1st Infantry Division who wore the insignia of a Red One as they landed on Omaha Beach on June the 6th. Director Samuel Fuller actually served with the Big Red One in real life, earning the Silver Star on D-Day. Perhaps the definitive film about D-Day, shot in black and white, was apparently entitled The Longest Day. Sorry, appropriately titled. The film encompasses the American, British, French as well as German perspective as D-Day unfolds. Then there's the ten-part Band of Brothers, a more recent, visually stunning and accurate portrayal of the 101st Airborne Division's role in World War II. These US paratroopers were one of the first Allied units to go into the battle on D-Day, and the series captures their war with gritty realism. But probably the most iconic portrayal of D-Day takes centre stage in the gripping war film Saving Private Ryan. The film is considered one of the greatest as well as the most controversial war films of all time. Its half-hour depiction of the bloody fighting on Omaha Beach is both vivid and terrifying. Apparently psychiatrists treating veterans with post-war traumatic stress disorder from the Vietnam and Iraq War advise them not to watch the film. If you've seen it, you'll understand why. It's probably the kind of film you watch only once. However terrifying, the reality of D-Day, June the 6th, 1944, was, by comparison with our subject today, only a minor skirmish in a global war against evil that's been raging since before the creation of the world. That's why I called it Holy War in Palestine. Mark Galley, in his book Jesus, Mean and Wild, describes the synagogue service at Capernaum, found in our reading Mark 1, 21-28. He describes it as Jesus' D-Day. It describes his beach landing to recapture lost territory, a battle with the forces of evil that rained down terror on him, the clearing of earth of demons. While a helpful if provocative analogy, I think it was actually much more certain, much more compelling and much more dramatic. In the synagogue in Capernaum, the people may have been both amazed and confused about who Jesus was, but the demons certainly understood. They were under no illusion, and neither should we. Please turn with me to Mark chapter 1, 21, 28, because I want to observe first the authoritative preaching of Jesus, that's verses 21, 22, then the awesome power of Jesus, 23 to 26, and then the amazing popularity of Jesus, 27 to 28. Then I want us to consider what applications we can draw from the story. First of all, the authoritative preaching of Jesus. Mark 1, 21. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. 
Absolutely no one fell asleep during Jesus' sermon. He didn't need any visual aids or PowerPoint presentations to keep their attention. He taught them with authority, unlike the teachers of the law. Why? Because at best they offered their interpretation of the scriptures and they quoted one another as preachers do today. Jesus was different. The word authority is linked to the word author. Imagine you're in the final of Mastermind. You choose the unique architecture of Apple computer software as your specialism. And your name happens to be Steve Jobs. No one know, knew more about the subject. Or you choose as your specialism the physics behind the cyclonic vacuum cleaner, which can separate dust with the force of 100,000 Gs. And your name happens to be Charles, Charles Dyson. Or you choose as your specialism the origin of the Harry Potter novels because your name is Joanne, Joanne Rowling. In each case, you'd be the world's leading authority and it would show immediately you knew what you were talking about. Well, Jesus spoke with authority because he is the author, he is the creator, he is the designer, the inventor of life on earth. He designed the sound waves, the human body, the ear, the mouth, the tongue, the mind, the language, the truth, the logic. No wonder he spoke with authority. The maker had arrived. The authoritative preaching of Jesus. Secondly, we note the awesome power of Jesus. Verse 23. Just then a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. And the impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. Notice where this all happens. Inside the synagogue. Does that surprise you? Why would the devil want to go to church? For three reasons. First, the devil wants to distract people. What did Jesus want the people to do? Listen to his teaching. Understand. Repent, believe the good news about God's kingly reign and be saved. What did Satan want them to do? Stop listening to Jesus. Remain ignorant, blind, enslaved, possessed, prejudiced. How could he achieve that? By creating a diversion. So what does he do? He interrupts Jesus. He cries out in a loud voice. Because the devil wants to distract people from listening to Jesus. Secondly, the devil wants to divert people from Jesus. A.W. Tozer said, The devil is a better theologian than any of us, and the devil still is. You see, the devil is monotheistic. He knows there is only one true God. He's there. He therefore doesn't deny Jesus. He actually confesses Jesus is both the man from Nazareth and the Holy One of God. But he tries to divert Jesus by impugning Jesus' motive. Imagine the man crying, Have you come to save us? But no, the demon makes him cry out, Have you come to destroy us? A paraphrase might be, What are you doing here? Jesus came to heal the sick, forgive sinners, release the oppressed, raise the dead, and deliver the oppressed, the possessed. He came to rescue all who would trust him. So Satan tries to impugn Jesus. Have you come to destroy us? That's why many people won't come to church. They're afraid, afraid of God. And tragic when they have a distorted image of Jesus. Where on earth did they get that idea from? Sadly, from many pulpits and so-called religious experts. If you doubt that Satan is at home in many churches, then reflect on the message delivered from many pulpits. All religions lead to God. The Bible's unreliable. Jesus was just a good man. Good works will save you. Try harder. Work longer. 
It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. You see, Satan wants to distract people. Satan wants to divert people because the devil wants to devour people. You see, the devil is quite happy for people to get religious. The more religious, the better. But at all costs, they must not dwell on Jesus and the cross. You may know C.S. Lewis wrote some fictional letters from a senior devil to a junior devil about the church. It's called the Screwtape Letters. In it he writes this, and he's writing as if he was the devil. One of our great allies at the present is the church itself. Do not misunderstand me. I don't mean the church as we see her spread out through all time and space and rooted in eternity, terrible as an army with banners. That, I confess, is a spectacle which makes our boldest tempters uneasy. But fortunately, it is quite invisible to these humans. All your patient sees is the half-finished sham Gothic erection on the new building estate. When he goes inside, he sees the local grocer, with rather an oily expression on his face, bustling up to offer him one shiny little book containing a liturgy which neither of them understands, and one shabby little book containing corrupt texts of mostly <coughs> religious lyrics, mostly bad and in very small print. And when he gets to his pew and looks around him, he sees just that selection of his neighbours whom he has hitherto avoided. You want to lean pretty heavily on those neighbours. Make his mind flit to and fro between an expression like the body of Christ and the actual faces in the next pew. Work hard then on the disappointment or anticlimax which is certainly coming to the patient during his first few weeks as a churchman. That's why Satan will encourage you to dwell on the music played out of key the misspelling of songs on the PowerPoint, the length of the sermon, the temperature, the notices, the rather quaint people in front. Anything but the message of Jesus. The demons were so used to having free reign in the synagogue. But this is D-Day. And so the man cries out in terror because the demons cannot cope with the purity and the holiness and the authority of Jesus. Notice he cries out, what do you want with us? Have you come to destroy us? Now he could be referring to his host or fellow demons. Either way he was terrified because Jesus, the Holy One of God, had showed up. Satan wanted to distract people, to divert people and to devour people. Then just as, he, as much as he does now. But on this occasion, Satan was about to lose control of this particular man. And like D-Day, it would mark the beginning of the end of his control of the world. Because in the face of the awesome power of Jesus, the demon is expelled with the simple words, Get out! We see here the authoritative preaching of Jesus and the awesome power of Jesus. But thirdly, I want you to notice the amazing popularity of Jesus. Verse 27. The people were so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about Jesus spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. You cannot stop good news spreading. People may be tired of religion, but they're not tired of Jesus. Among those being saved, Jesus is good news. The traditional denominations may be shrinking, but the Church of Jesus Christ is growing. And where is the Church growing most rapidly? Where the Church is persecuted most strongly. Figure that, and you will understand this passage and its application today. In our passage today, we've discovered the authoritative preaching of Jesus, the awesome power of Jesus, and the amazing popularity of Jesus. This skirmish with the demon in the synagogue at Capernaum foreshadowed 
Jesus' supreme victory when he defeated Satan and his demonic forces by dying on the cross, liberating all hell captive to the power of Satan. If Easter was VE Day when Satan was defeated, we look forward to VJ Day when the Lord Jesus will return in great power, returning with his angels and destroy Satan and all who identify with him and deliver us saints into eternal glory. Because between these two events, VE Day and VJ Day, the battle is not over yet. Despite the apparent peace and tranquility of this morning's undistracted uh, activities, you were in church today, the beautiful music, uplifting hymns, thoughtful intercessions, challenging message and fresh coffee to follow. And we're still living and labouring and taking casualties because this is still a war zone. Satan is defeated, but he's not destroyed. That is why Jesus sends us out in his name and with his authority to liberate others from Satan's control by sharing the authority of teaching of Jesus and through the Holy Spirit demonstrating the awesome power of Jesus. You see, Jesus promises blessing not if, but when we're insulted, when we're falsely accused of all kinds of evil, because we identify with Jesus. If you'd like to explore this theme in more detail, uh, check out the text of this, uh, this sermon on my website and look for the hyperlink to my presentation on Christian Jihad. But as we close... Imagine today is D-Day. We are in one of those troop carriers heading through the water for the Normandy beaches. And in the words of the Apostle Paul to Timothy, I invite you to join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus, for then your suffering will not be in vain and his blessing, his victory will be assured. Amen.